All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with science class here. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, energy and as it pertains to resources and kind of where energy comes from um, and not necessarily talking about energy in a, in a big picture way like we have. Been. So let me pull up my power. I'm talking about. So in this instance, when we're talking about sources of energy, we're, we're talking about you know, things that we use to power our, you know, our society, you know, whether we're talking about cars or electricity or whatever it may be, right? So um, the first thing I want to talk about and kind of explain here is uh, the obvious difference between what we call non-renewable energy sources and, re and renewable. Uh, non-renewable energy sources are kind of exactly what they sound like. So if renewable, it means to be able to reuse and reuse and reuse. Non-renewable is the opposite, of that, right? So non-renewable energy is once you've used it once, gone, right? So that's essentially all types of fossil fuels. We call them that because they're the remains of these old organisms that have kind of broken down. The end result is essentially coal, petroleum, or oil, right? natural gas. Right? So all of those things are non renewable energy in terms of when you fill your car up with gas. Unfortunately, when you get to empty, it doesn't refill itself, right? You've got to go to a gas station and pump more gas in, right? Once gas has been used as an energy source, gone, and you're left with having to put more of that fuel source in, whether we're talking about cars, or appliances, or, wh or whatever we're talking about, right? So non-renewable energy sources, you use it, and you got to get more. So Downside to non renewable energy sources is there's a finite amount of it. So you know, at some point, that supply will run out. And the polluting aspect of non renewable energy, because to burn and use that energy source, there are pollution, um, polluting repercussions, right? So, like, because it's going somewhere, right? That gasoline is being burned and then emitted as smoke or gas, or whatever, right? And that gas is then going into the atmosphere. So that's kind of the downside to non renewable. The plus side is it's the most readily available source of renewable or of energy, right? So most people and most things are powered by non renewable energy. And we'll get to kind of a breakdown of that here in a minute. Um, let's run through some of the renewable energy sources. Renewable, again, means when we use it once, we can use it again and again and again and again. So solar energy, and I'm just going to kind of run through these quickly. Solar energy is energy from the sun. So positives to solar energy are that it, you know, it doesn't pollute. It can be stored and reused because the sun comes up every day, right? But the downside to solar energy is you can't produce it at night. You don't generate a lot of it in the winter. You don't generate a lot of it when it's cloudy. So you need direct sunlight to get maximum benefits from solar energy. So all of these energy sources, whether we're talking about renewable or non-renewable, they're all limited in some way. They're limited in terms of the availability, limited in terms of benefits, you know, strengths, and weak, and they're also limited by, they all have a downfall to them, right? None of them are perfect. Geothermal energy. Geothermal energy is essentially harnessing the naturally hot water that, you know, comes out in the form of hot springs. Right? And you can harness that hot water to be used as energy. Again, a very clean, non-polluting source, but the problem with geothermal energy is 
there aren't hot springs everywhere, right? There are lots of them, and we happen to live in an area where there is lots of animal activity, but around the world, there are plenty of don't have any source of geothermal energy. So it's not something that's readily available to everyone. Okay, wind energy. Wind energy is harnessing the power of the wind. Right? So wind energy works by these giant windmills. When the wind blows those turbines, those turbines start to spin and spin and spin, and that spinning is what generates the electricity that's then stored and then Places just as any type of other. Again, very clean energy. Not you're not generating pollution by having those turbines spin. But there are lots of downfalls to them as well. And and I'm not as I go through these, I'm not advocating for one or the other. I'm just kind of laying out all the different options in terms of how our country and how our world holds energy and the various places we get energy from, talking about some of the good things about them, and then obviously some other shortcomings. And so the downfall with wind energy is that there's a lot of waste created in the form of old turbines, uh, defunct windmills, right? And that stuff is, just the, especially the blades themselves, those things are huge. Break them down when they're done and, you know, essentially useless of them is not easy and not they're made of particularly resilient material that doesn't decompose easily. So there are things people are having to figure out for you know the best way to repurpose old windmills because the whole point of some of these renewable energy sources the whole purpose for a lot of the innovation behind them and a lot of the push to develop them more is to, to limit pollution. Right? And some of these issues are the things people are trying to deal with to come up with new ideas for how to best um, minimize some of these problems. Right? Uh, water energy. So just like the way the wind powers those turbines in a windmill, you can harness the energy of flowing water the very same way, right? And that is in the form of dams. And a clean energy source, but dams have their own set of issues also, right? So you're impacting the, the surrounding environment by you know, taking a naturally flowing river and barricading it off and creating these man-made lakes, essentially, and that has benefits and it has right? It's not as easy for fish to pass through, and in some cases, impossible. So, and it also changes the ecosystem around uh, in the river, around the edges of the river. And so all those things have to be taken into account, you know, the more we use water energy. And then lastly on this list of renewable energy sources would be biomass. Biomass is just a kind of a general term that applies to plant or animal material used for energy. It can be Biomass can take the shape of a lot of different things. Purposefully grown energy crops. So a lot of times corn is grown specifically to then turn around and create fuel out of it. And, or it could be wood, right? It could be, it, in here, in my definition, it says wood or forest residue. So it could be wood, just in its raw form, or it could be the kind of leftover scraps and gunk that aren't used uh, by the timber industry, right? That was kind of scrapped to be collected and then used in turn for some kind of fuel, right? Uh, waste from food, from food crops, uh, horticulture, food processing, animal farming, human waste. So we can use a, a lot of that stuff to actually and turn it into usable energy. The disadvantage to all of these biomass just the amount of space that it required to grow them, or in a lot of cases, to store it once it's uh, ready to be used as fuel, is, it takes up a lot of space. And so, again, though that also has certain downfalls when we're talking about being used practically. 
And then the, the last form of energy on here, and I have it as its own uh, separate category, uh, is nuclear energy. And so nuclear energy is essentially the energy given by breaking up or breaking apart atoms and uh, harnessing the, the burst of energy from, from those atoms. And nuclear power plants are potentially endlessly renewable. They also can be, they also can have issues with radiation. They can have issues if there's something that goes wrong. We're talking about major issues, health issues. So nuclear energy is volatile and somewhat controversial in terms of whether we should be using it or shouldn't be using it, right? But in a way, it's somewhat renewable because we can create it over and over again. So, but it, but I've, I've kind of lumped it into its own category for this. All right. So hopefully, if you're watching this. Uh, somewhat helpful and, and not too uh, tedious. But I want to spend a little bit of time going over kind of a, a graphic that illustrates kind of these points I've been talking about, and then we'll uh, run through a couple of practice questions. So I realized that this whole time I've been blabbing on and I'm not even PowerPoint slide in. Uh, Perform, but information is the same, so hopefully, you can see that okay. And, and um, so, next, this is the slide that I wanted to kind of go over next. And all of this, all of this is, is kind of a breakdown of the energy that we consume. So, this is the United States, and this is 2016, so not totally up to date, but the most up to date thing that I could find. And it shows us of energy that we use of all these different types of energy. So obviously petroleum, oil, gas, that's the biggest chunk of our energy consumption. 37% of our energy consumption is petroleum. 29% of that is natural gas. 15% is coal powered. 10% is renewable energy. And 9% is nuclear electric. So this has nuclear power separate from renewable also, and so that's partly why I broke it up. So all of those different forms of renewable energy we talked about only make up 10% of the total energy consumption for our country. Again, this is almost four years old, so those numbers have probably changed over the last few years. But again, for the purposes of this conversation, this is as up-to-date as, as we are going to get. And up to date. Okay. But just keep in mind, those numbers are always shifting. And, and more likely than not, the shift is probably more renewable energy and less non renewable energy in general, right? We're, we're trying to figure out more ways to better use renewable energy. We have a long way to go in terms of getting to that end goal. That's generally the trend, right, in our country and around the world. So if we also, and, and this has kind of an interesting um, breakdown here on the right-hand side. So the, the pie chart on the left just shows total energy. But then this, this graphic here on the right is showing of that 10% of renewable, of energy that is renewable, okay, how is it broken down into all the different types of renewable energy? You can see geothermal, very little, 2% of 2% of that 10% is geothermal. Geothermal is just a tiny sliver of the, the renewable energy that we use. Okay? Only 6% is solar. My hunch is that over the last four years, that number especially has probably grown just with the popularity and the prevalence of solar energy. But again, four years ago, solar energy only made up 6% of that of that little 10% slice. So again, not a very big piece of the pie. 21% is wind energy. 24% up here on the top is hydroelectric. And then biomass, which is broken down into these different categories, 
makes up 46%. So if you take into account wood, biofuel, and biomass waste, and kind of all lumping them together, the biomass makes up the biggest chunk of that. So if you're looking at them individually, hydroelectric would be the most important. But again, that makes sense when you think about how many windmills do you see? Quite a bit compared to solar panels. How many dams do you see? Quite a bit. Right? So it makes sense that wind and hydroelectric would be kind of some of the most pre prevalent forms of energy we see in terms of renewable energy. Biomass definitely, because it encompasses a lot of different types of energy, that um, makes up the, the majority of it. Especially because biomass specifically can be turned into things to power things like cars, which wind, solar, and hydroelectric tend to do less or not at all, unless we're talking about powering solar electric cars. Um, with that said, uh, let's look at just a few practice questions. So let me stop and put on a handy dandy questions and we'll just do a few of these we're not going to run through all of them um, especially these first three which kind of deal with this graph here so I'll zoom in a little bit all right so here's a graph of the world petroleum consumption so across the globe between 2003 and 2011 here is the line graph for the world's petroleum con cons consumption, and it's in quadrillion BTU. And BTUs is just a, a, a way we measure energy, and it stands for British thermal units. Again, not important, other than that's just a form of measurement that we can use. Quadrillion Quadrillion. Okay. So, Number one says approximately how many quadrillion BTUs of petroleum were consumed in 2011? 160, 170, 174, 177. So anytime you see the word approximately, don't panic and think, I, 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 you know, just remind yourself, approximately just means roughly, right? Where does the line seem like it might? So your answer, might be slightly different than all of the answer choices there. Okay. Look for the one that's closest to what you think is the right answer. So find 2011, so right here on the end. So basically, where is this line right here at the end of the uh, chart or the end of the graph? It's something over 175. We know that, right? So that rules out everything but D. So think about it that way. That makes it real cut and dry. You don't have to think. Is it 176? Is it 178? Is it 177? Right? Don't, that's too much, that's putting too much thought in there, right? Look at 2011, notice that it's above 175. Then, before you worry about anything, look at your answer choices and see, is there anything else that makes sense? And here, there isn't even a second option. 177 is the only thing that makes sense. So D is the right answer. Okay. Uh, number two. Between its low point in 2003 and its high point in 2011, the approximate range of the data regarding world petroleum consumption, blank quadrillion BT. So between its low point, 2003, and its high point in 2011, the approximate range. So when we've talked about the mean, median, mode, range, range means the distance between the highest and lowest points in a set of means. Right, so the range is simply taking whatever this number is, call it 177, taking whatever this number is, call it 163, okay, and find the difference between those two, right? The difference between 177 and 163. I just didn't want to. Make a dumb math error, put it out there for people in the YouTube universe. So I had to check my math real fast. But 177 minus 163, 
happens to be 14. Okay? So let's assume maybe you look at this and you say, well, I think it's 162 or something. And 177 minus 162 is 15. Okay? Don't get hung up on the fact that 15 isn't there. Just look and see what's close. 14 is, is our answer. Okay, so again, anytime you're asked to approximate anything, think about it generally speaking, big picture. Don't worry about trying to be very specific. Uh, and then lastly, let's see, we'll do um, just a couple more. We're going to do number three, and then we'll probably do number five and call it a day. So, number three, and I'm zooming quite a bit, quite a way down here, so. Number three says, which of the following sentences best summarizes the information in the graphs? A, world petroleum consumption increased by about 14 quadrillion BTUs between 2003 and 2011. B, world petroleum consumption fell by about four quadrillion BTUs between 2005 and 2009. Uh, C, World petroleum consumption increased by roughly 50% between 2003 and 2007. Or B, world petroleum consumption fell by roughly 50% between 2007 and Okay, so pretty straightforward. We're looking to see which of these best summarizes the information. So P, we need to know what, what it means when it asks us to summarize. Summarizes to kind of get the general idea of what the graph's shown. What is the purpose? And think about B, C, and D for just a minute. Okay. B, whether the whether the data that or the statement they're giving you is true. Don't think about that for a minute. Just the, so B is only looking at the time frame between 2005 and 2009. C is only looking at the time frame between 2003 and 2007. And D is only looking at between 2007 and 2009. So to best summarize something, we want to know that the statement should encompass everything on the graph, right? And so B, C, and D are only looking at little chunks of the graph. So right away to me, A stands out as being correct because A is the only one that looks at the, the entire time frame between 2003 and 2011. So that to me stands out as being the best answer for what summarizes the graph because it says 2003, it started here in 2011, it ended here, and everything in between is useful information, but in terms of summarizing the graph, right, the big picture takeaway is, 2003 it was less, in 2011 it's more. Okay. A is the right answer. And then lastly, number five, talks about this paragraph here, or I guess is based on this question here, or this paragraph, sorry. So number five says the overall demand for water in developing nations, or sorry, developed nations, that's Difference. So the overall demand for water in developed nations is rising, but it is not rising as quickly as people had predicted it, predicted it would. In fact, the rate of water consumption per person per year in developed nations has actually dropped. This means that even though population has increased and industrial output has grown, the rate at which people withdraw water from reservoirs, rivers, and aquifers has slowed down. Which of the following is the likely reason for the drop in per person consumption of water in developed countries? So let's look at our choices and again see what makes the most sense. Right? A. Vast new supplies of water have been found in the developed nations. Possible, but not likely. Right? That sounds to me like a, a bum answer. Right? So I. I'm hesitant to throw it out, but it doesn't seem like it's going to be the right answer. B, developed nations have starting, started using water more efficiently than they did in the past. Okay? That stands out to me as being probably a pretty good answer. Look at C and D and make sure we, we still like it. C, 
says developed nations are sharing water resources with, with each other. Okay. Again, not impossible, but not likely. I, I lump it in with A as being an unlikely answer to it. And then D, some developed nations export fresh water to other nations that lack it. First of all, whether or not that's true, if it is true, that's actually developed nations giving away water, which wouldn't explain a drop in water use. So D doesn't quite fit at all. So I'm throwing D out for sure. A and C don't seem particularly likely. So I'm going to go with B. Developed nations have started using water more efficiently than they did in the past. Again, the question just says which of the following is a likely reason. It doesn't say definitively is the reason. It just says which of these is most likely. And A and C, while it's possible, don't seem likely to be, whereas B seems much more plausible, believable. Okay? And it's as simple as that. So try not to overcomplicate some of these you know, word problems that are really you know, heavy with vocabulary. All they're trying to do is confuse you and, and trick you to a certain extent, essentially to test you to see, can you, can you read through all of this uh, confusion to find the answer? The real question here isn't as, as difficult as they make it seem. All right, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop for the day. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys their weekend, and uh, I will see everyone back again for classes on Monday. So, good one, everybody.